begin this Sunday morning um, by addressing some of the events that have been happening uh, in America and around the world recently. Um, some of this might be quite hard to hear, might hard, quite hard to listen to. There's some sensitive stuff we're going to be talking about. Um, so if you've got children that um, might understand some of this, um, I'm going to just ask you to use your discretion. Um, if you feel it's better for them, then take them out of the room, distract them with something. Um, we're just going to be talking about it for five minutes or so. Um, but I think it's really important that we do. So I'll just give you a second just to, if you want to, to remove them from the room or give them something to distract them. Obviously what we're talking about is, um, in part, is the brutal, horrific murder of George Floyd in America at the hands of someone who was supposed to be protecting him and looking after him, um, a police officer. This murder involved a police officer kneeling on his neck for around eight minutes while George begged for his life. Um, if you've not seen it, it is really quite harrowing footage. And it's sad as an isolated incident, it's really horrific as an isolated incident, but the worst thing is that this is just one of a multitude of thing, times this has happened. Not just in America, but around the world. And I think most of you will have seen that it's been all over the news, it's been all over everywhere. And there's been worldwide protests and localised riots. And we even see, again, other in other, another horrific thing that these people who are crying out to be heard in protest of police systems and political systems, people that are peacefully protesting. We see videos and news stories of them being arrested. We see videos and news stories of news reporters being arrested because the police don't want them to see what's happening. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, really, of, of what's going on not just in America, but in the world in general. In our country, in the UK, black boys are 40 times, 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched by police. Just think about that. 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police. It's not something I've ever thought would happen to me. It's not something that would ever have happened to me, but other black males my age are 40 times more likely to have been stopped and searched while only making up three and a half percent of our population in the UK black people make up 10 percent of the prison population what does that tell you about the way that our justice system is weighted against black people that actually is a worse disparity than what is going on in the US in their prison systems. It actually representatively is worse than what is in the US. But it's not a problem that is just political. It's not a problem that is just a policing matter or a judge's um, discretion that we have a load of racist judges. Actually, this racism, this prejudice and discrimination is something that is in each of us we actually are conditioned to think in certain ways that would put certain people down and raise other certain people up we each have inclinations towards and against certain demographics of people whether that's different races different social backgrounds the way people speak schools people have gone to, the universities people have gone to, the jobs people have, we have inclinations to wards and against certain people. We as a church, we as the leadership want to say to all the black and other minority ethnic groups 
among us and around our community that we are with you. We stand with you in this fight against racism. We are for you. We want to support you in every way that we can because we understand that we are we are three white leaders from fairly good homes we we will never fully grasp what your day-to-day -day feels like in a predominantly white town we can never understand what it will feel like to walk down the road and be looked at differently and we are committed to raising up doing our part to raise up all those who have been oppressed by prejudice and discrimination. We're committed to raising up leaders of all ethnicities, regardless of what the population of Blackpool looks like and the percentages, because God's church isn't a representation of the world. God's church is a representation of who he is and who he loves and his children represent the spectrum of his whole creation so we're committed to raising the profile of all black and minority ethnicities in our church and in our town because God's church is different he wants his church to be a shining light to the world God doesn't prefer segregation God prefers to have all his people worshipping together, loving one another. And we, we want to commit as a leadership and as a church to what we've been talking about in 1 Peter, where it says that above all, love one another because love covers a multitude of sins. There are a multitude of sins here. On my own part, on each of our parts, there are sins and we have to love one another above all we have to love one another to cover over these sins to make right what was wrong we're not perfect we're probably going to get it wrong in certain ways at certain times but we know we have to do something so this is our commitment to anyone in our church who feels downtrodden but particularly to the black people in our church at this time we want to say black lives matter god cares and we care for you we love you jesus i, I pray god would you help us to address our own racist tendencies our own prejudicial tendencies God, help us to figure out where we've been going wrong. Help us to see our own sin and love instead. God, we want to turn from any racist practices, any racist ways of talking or being or anything that would, that would, that would continue the oppression that is going on throughout our country. God, we say we, we offer this up to you and, and, and ask, would you please send your spirit and help us, God. Help us to represent your kingdom. Help us to live in love and not fear. Help us to live in your grace and not in what we have been conditioned uh, to live as. God, we ask, would you bring justice to these situations going on around the world? Would you bring justice to all who have been wrongly abused by those whose care they should be in, whose, to all those who have been killed, God, would you bring justice upon the people who have murdered these innocent black people? God, we ask these things in your name because you're holy and you're good and you are making your creation perfect. Bless us now as we worship you, God. We, we turn now to you because you are the source of love and life. You are the source of all things good and you are the main. You are the source of justice in this world. God, bring your kingdom. Amen.
Hey guys, welcome to our Sunday worship. Um, I hope that um, this morning finds you well. I hope that um, you've had a good week. Um, and even if you hadn't, we're going to praise God this morning because he's so good and glorious. Let's start in prayer. Father, we just offer this time up to you. Whether we're young or old, whether we're fit or unwell, God, we, we want to lift up our voices to you, God. In each of our homes across this town and beyond, we want to lift up your name, God, and say that you are our king, you are our Lord, you're the one that we're following, you're the one we want to give our lives to, because you're so good, because you're so generous and kind and loving towards us, God. Lord, when we can't see you working, you're still working. God, when we can't hear your voice, you're still speaking, God. I pray that we, in this time, would get to know more of you. But God, even above that, God, we just want to lift up your name. God, we want to serve you and worship you because you are holy, because you're our Father, because you're so, so good. We're going to raise a hallelujah to you, God.
pray that we would love you as Jesus commanded us to. We pray that by your spirit you're putting in us that, that soul and mind and body and strength love towards you. We pray that we would be like Mary who when you came to our home all she could do was sit at your feet God. We pray that that would be our worship to you. That our souls would long to know you. That when when we come close to you, we don't want to just do a load of stuff. We don't want to just sing a load of songs, but we want to just look at you, God. We want to just look at you and, and see you for who you are and take you in. Because there's so much to know, God. We don't just want to know things about you either, but we want to know you, God. We want to know who you are. We want to know how much you love us, God, because we know it's far beyond anything we can imagine. God, far beyond any love that we can find in this world is found in you, God. So we come to your feet now, God, and we say, Jesus, Father, Spirit, be blessed. 
oh God, we want to lift you up because of how much you bless us, God. We're going to keep singing. We're going to keep praising God because he's so good to us.
yeah, King Jesus, my soul sings to you. King Jesus, my soul cries out your name. God, when I think of the sacrifice you've made, my heart just longs to, to be with you and be close to you. your prophetic doesn't need us to be with one another does it need to be we don't need to be next to one another to be able to hear from your spirit God we do that on our own God in our hearts God I pray stir in us a new movement of your spirit God stir us to pray God God, as we see you more and more for who you are, our hearts turn to you more and more, and our lives turn into your path more and more, God. We pray, would you just keep revealing yourself to us, God. Keep revealing your majesty to us, God, so that your church will become as holy as you promised it one day will be. God, as beautiful as it will be on that last day, God. I thank you that you are doing that, God. You are making your church holy. God, that we see you and we praise you and we pray to you, God. We, we don't rest when there's injustice. We don't rest when there's unrest in the world, God. Because creation is not currently as you want it to be, God. There is evil in creation, God, and you will not stand for it, God. We stand together as your church saying we stand against injustice. We stand against taking prisoners, we stand against hierarchies, God we know it's not people, we know it's not kings or emperors that stand in our way, God it's your enemies, but you show us through your Old Testament and New Testament that when your power comes, nothing can stand, your enemies melt like wax before you, God we pray bring a fresh wave of your spirit into your people God, that your enemies see moving and they melt like wax God we just praise you for all you've done and all you will do and all you are doing God Holy Spirit come be in us in the darkness we were Without light, till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
armored conquered death And the dead rose from the tombs And the angels heard it all For the souls of all who come To the Father are restored And the church of Christ was born Then the Spirit lit the flame Now this gospel truth of all Will not yield, shall not God, we know that for a time unimaginable, the angels have been in heaven worshipping you, singing glory to your name, singing Hosanna, Hosanna, holy is the King in the highest. And God, we know that those praises will go on forevermore. God, I pray that our praises in this time will just be a reflection of what a praise our life is to you. That is our wish for ourselves, God, is that our lives can praise you. Our lives can offer worship to you. Our lives can lift up your name. God, that's our desire, is to give you praise. God, we love you. God, be with us as we go and hear the word. God, we need your presence to understand it. God, we bless you, our Father. Amen. Hello, I'm Julie. I hope you enjoyed our time of worship. We're heading over to Zoom now. Please contact us if you'd like to join. Everyone is welcome. On screen soon there will be some slides showing you what's going on through the week. After that, today's message will be shown here. So, keep an eye on the timer, grab a drink, sit back and enjoy. And if you'd like to connect with us, we'd love to hear from you.
everyone, I'm Ben, I'm one of the leaders here at Christchurch Blackpool and we're going through a series in the book of Joshua and today we're going to be in chapter 2. Scott led us through chapter 1 last week and we looked at with this encouragement to be bold, to be strong, to be courageous. You see Israel, they find themselves on the east bank of the Jordan. The, the, the land of Canaan is before them, but they have to cross over this river to get there. And, and, and God comes to them and he encourages them to be strong, to be brave, to be, to be courageous. And actually, well, this, this paralyze, par- parallels in our lives. You see, God, God, God has many things for us to do. He has things for us to take. He has things for us to inherit. And it's not land for us. It's not, not the, the promised land. It's not, not, not the land of Canaan. But actually, it's, it's people. It's people, it's souls, it's, it's gifts of grace. And actually he, he is, is asking us to be bold as a people, to be strong, to be courageous and step in, to physically step in to these things that he has promised us, to speak to people, to act out, to pray, to, 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 to when we hear the v- w- words of God, that we do them rather than ignore them. We act with faith rather than run in fear. And Joshua's response to this call from God to be brave, to be courageous, to be be full of faith, is that he gathers some spies and he sends them into the promised land. And he tells them to go through the land, search out the land, see what it's like, just like he was and some of his friends were were told to do 40 years before, to go into the land with him, um, Caleb and some others, and to see how good the land was. And they're told to go throughout the land. They're told to to see these seven nations that are within this land, to see them, to see these strong peoples, see, see them go through the land and and, and, and go there and especially to seek out and see what the city of Jericho is like. The city of Jericho, which is basically kind of the, the entrance point to the land. If they can take Jericho, they can take anything. It's kind of the, the feelings. And now remember, remember back 40 years ago to when Joshua and Caleb and the others first went in, in Numbers chapter 13, 40 years previously. And they came back and they gave this bad report. They gave this bad report despite only just being led through the Red Sea. The, the Red Sea which, which God parted before them and, 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 and God then closed behind them crushing Pharaoh's army. They didn't do that. They didn't win that battle. God defeated Pharaoh's army. God defeated the most powerful army of their day. And that, that, that's, that has just happened. And, you know, they, they've seen some amazing wonders and signs. They've seen this this pillar uh, of, of, of smoke and fire go before them. They've seen these, these, these amazing um, plagues go on their enemies of, of, of darkness, of, of hailstones, of, 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 of pestilence, of frogs, of blood, of, of the firstborn son being killed. They've just seen this all happen. And then as they get to the land, they see these people who are a bit scary and they say, we can't do this. We can't enter the land. I mean, this has just happened. But now, 40 years on, I mean, they've had some miracles. Yeah, you know, they, they, they've been fed every morning. This manna has come from heaven. They've had quail. They, they, their shoes haven't worn out. You know, great, amazing. You know, it'd be wonderful. But if I'm just about to go into battle, I don't like you, but if I'm just about to go into battle, I would much rather have the Red Sea parting and God doing plagues and signs uh, and wonders uh, to destroy my enemies in, in, in recent history rather than my shoes have lasted. I mean, that's great, brilliant, especially if you've got kids, you know, uh, when whenever the kids go back to school, maybe yours are, yours are back already, but whenever your kids go back to school, I guarantee, I guarantee whatever happens, I guarantee is they'll probably need new school shoes. You know, things like, it, because th- their feet grow, in, but but imagine if you went for 40 years and no one had to buy, no one had to make any new shoes. It's amazing. You know, you didn't have to worry about food. Wonderful. But... I'd still be a bit nervous about taking on these amazing, kind of mighty warrior nations. And, you know, and for the modern day, I love, I love seeing miracles. I don't know about you. I love seeing miracles. I love, I love seeing healings. I love seeing chronic diseases go. I love seeing, you know, legs, legs grow. Um, you know, people like unexplainably recovering from cancer or, or, or other things like that. I, I love seeing it when people receive money. I love seeing it when, when, 
but buildings which, which we have no right to obtain are obtained, you know, by faith. You know, I, I let, when I see this, these things, my faith is lifted. My, my, my faith it, it becomes greater because because these things are are, are there. Are, are, they've just happened, and, and it kind of it snowballs effect of what, what I believe God can do. And about you, it kind of what happens, especially what happens recently, affects on what we can what we believe sometimes. And, and just think about these Israelites. The, 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 the Red Sea, that's amazing. That was 40 years ago. That was ancient history for these guys. And, and that's that's true for so many of us. We can see God do some amazing, maybe some of us have seen God do amazing things, but we kind of think, oh yeah, but what has God done? recently and by recently we were, what, what has he done like this week what has he done today so when in in this chapter the spies go into the land and they come back i'm thinking back to number to numbers 13 i'm thinking well it was bad report there surely how, how can they have a good report now i mean god's done some impressive stuff but what he's done doesn't feel as impressive as he did in the book of exodus kind of 40 years before but here we go we read in joshua 2 22 to 24 we read when they left they went into the hills and stayed there three days until their pursuers had searched all the roads and returned without finding them then the two men started back they went down out of the hills fought the river and came to joshua son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them then they said to joshua The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the peoples are melting before us. So this is is a report. This is they've been into land. We'll read about what happens in the land in a second. But they've been into land and they're on their way back. And as they come back to Joshua, their report is the Lord has surely given us the land. Now we're going to read in a second. Actually, they were hiding. They were hiding for their lives. They were running for their lives. You know, they just come to this great city, which which was walled up to heaven, which no one could go in, no one could come come, come out of. Uh, 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 but their their view of this isn't. There's nothing we can do about this. Well, actually, their view is we can't do anything about this. Their view is actually humanly. We can't win this. The people are too big. The people are too strong. The cities are too well fortified. But we have. God. We have God. And nothing is important for God. No, nothing is, is impossible for God. And the, the people, and whether we know it or not, the people know that. And they are melting like wax. You see, they give they give a report, actually, on, on a base level that feels like it's not built on reality. In a physical level, it doesn't feel like it's built like on reality. If they were going to build, found that their, their report on reality, or on the physical, they'd say, We need to just stay here. We need to wait because there's no way we can get into this land. But actually, that's not what they bring back because ultimately what they bring back shows that what they see is not the physical problems before them. What they see, they see with the eyes of faith. They have faith. They're not deluded. They're not, 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 they're not self-confident to, to such an extent where they think anything can anyone will fall at their feet no matter what they do. No. They have faith. They have faith in a God who is able to do anything. Guys, what's your faith in? What do you believe in? What do you put your trust in? See, the report these guys bring back is full of faith. It's not in how strong they are. It's not in the size of their army. It's not in their skill. No, it's in none of those things. It is in the understanding that the Lord has said the land is yours. I am giving you. I am giving you the land. It is in God's view, in the way that God's speaking to them, it's past tense. I, I'm, it's yours. I've given it to you. It belongs to you. you. You may be on the east side of the Jordan, the land's on the west side, but in reality, the land is yours. Full stop. That's it. End. You see, what, what, we, can, we can put these barriers up, can't we? We can look. We can look at our world around us. We can look at our town and say, how on earth is it going to be changed? 
How on earth are we, a small, small, tiny group of people, going to impact this land, to impact this town for God's gospel, for God's glory, for God's kingdom? It's impossible. Well, it is in human eyes. But if we look with the eyes of faith, we look with the eyes that say that it's not about us and us fighting the battle alone, it's about Jesus and him, an almighty, great, amazing, wonderful God, the God of the universe on our side. We see that actually God can save anyone. Not because of who they are or who we are, but because of what he has done. See, God God can save anyone, not because of what we do or have done or will do, but because of who he is. That is the truth, church. That is the truth. God saves because of who he is and what he has done, not because of what we have done or will do or who we are. It is all about God. God changes hearts. God changes minds. God saves. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Church, salvation is from God. Salvation is from God and God alone. Salvation comes by grace from Jesus Christ. And it it comes when we put our faith in Jesus. But what what Paul says here in Ephesians is that even that faith isn't something that we stir up, that that we try our hardest to obtain it. The faith that we have to believe in Jesus is a gift of God. So, 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 so just like with, with Joshua and the Israelites taking the land, okay, it's not about how strong they are, how skillful they are, the, the, how big their army is, that the, they will take the land, they will t- walk into their inheritance. It's about God moving. And it's the same for our neighbours, for our friends, for our co-workers, for those who we see on our streets, for those who we, we spend our time with. It's not about how skillful, how, 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 how uh, articulate we are with our words. It's about God coming and God using and taking the words that we have and implanting gifts of faith, gifts of faith into them, so that they may cry out, Lord, save me. See, we're going to see what happens in this in this chapter. We're going to see what happens, uh, and what we're going to see is is how that a woman named Rahab, who as we'll see, is about as far from Jesus as you could possibly get, humanly speaking, how she receives this gift of faith and she believes in the one true God. You see, the spies, they come into the land, that they search at the land and they go to Jericho. And, and when they're in Jericho, they go to this to Rahab's place. In Rahab, a local called Rahab the prostitute, Rahab the harlot. And they go there because probably because because it was a place where travellers would have gone and there they would be able to suss out and find out news or how the people were feeling, not just there in Jericho, but throughout the land, how, what things were like, how things were going. And, and whilst they're there, word gets to the king that they've been there. And so the king sends his men to, to Rahab's place to to talk to, to, to try and arrest them, to try and take them, to kill them. And basically Rahab protects them. Rahab uh, takes them, she hides them in, in the roof and looks after them and then lies to the guys who have come to, to search them and just tells them that, well, they were here. Yes, I can't deny that. You still want to see them. But, but they left and they've gone. Go, go that way and you'll surely catch them. But be quick, be quick. And whilst they're gone, she then looks after these guys before sending them out. And we see that actually the reason why this happens in 2 verses 8 to 13. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up to the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare 
the lives of my father and mother and brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and that you shall save us from death. This is amazing. This is, oh, this is truly amazing, this statement. I don't know if you quite get it, if you quite picked it up, but basically when Rahab proclaims you know, that you, that your God is the God of heaven above and earth below. And basically what she's saying in that one statement is, my gods, my people worship are rubbish. My practices are worthless. This woman who could not be further from God is saying, my practices are rubbish. My gods are useless. It's you who worship the one true God. Please, will he save me? I know he has saved you. Please may he save you. Basically, she's falling down on her knees as the, as the Philippian jailer did in Acts and saying, what must I do to be saved? And how does she get to this point? How does she get to this point? It says, because she heard. We have heard, she says, we have heard. She, she, she has heard about what God has done in saving the Israelite people, about bringing this, these slaves out of captivity, about, about the, the battles that they have gone through. She has heard about these. And, and, and because of this, this she, she, she falls down on her knees and says, please save me. And I have, have, have encouragement on this. Because she hasn't heard the whole gospel. She's only heard a little. She's not even heard everything that the Israelites know at this time. She's just heard what travellers have told her. And still that is enough. That is a tiny seed that's been planted in her. Which grows into saving faith. As she proclaims, God, save me. She doesn't know if God will save her. She doesn't know if she will be accepted. She doesn't know anything about what God is really like. Other than he is a God who saves. And she needs a God who saves in this moment. And so she leans on them and she says, please, please, please save me. Save my family. See, Jesus, Jesus talks about seed being sown. He talks about seed being thrown on, the, on, on, on soil, a, a good soil, in thorns and, in, and on the path. And he talks about how the seed grows. And, and just side note, this, these are times when I question whether Jesus really knew what he was talking about. Because, you know, I try to grow grass. And, 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 and he talks about seed going on the good soil and it grows and uh, seed going on the path being eaten by the birds. My, my, my honest, I don't know if God is mocking me, maybe, but, but my honest kind of uh, 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 experience is that the seed that goes on the path grows. It grows between the, the flagstones. It grows, it, it wonderfully grows. So much, and the seed that, that goes on, on the grass, it gets eaten by the birds. It, and it doesn't grow. I mean, so much so that I've, got, I've come up with this really successful form of grass transplantation, where literally I am, I am making the grass on my lawn grow really nicely by taking the grass that's growing on the path and replanting it on the lawn. It works great, but that's, that's just me. Maybe the rest of you don't have that problem. Uh, but, but, but what Jesus is saying is basically that, that ultimately, normally, that the grass that goes on, the, the seed that goes on the good soil, that the word that goes on the good soil, it, by faith it grows. It grows. It grows. And this is what, what, what has happened to Rahab. And, and again, take heart. Because, because, because you know, we, we, we may not always be able to explain the full gospel to someone. We may think, ah, oh, you know, I didn't get to share the proper full thing to her. Or to them, oh, I mumbled through my words and it didn't quite work. Well, that sometimes that little bit that we do say can be enough. Can be enough. Can be that seed that grows by faith into salvation. And actually, also what we see here is actually probably the these spies didn't say anything to her. Really, you know, the, the stuff that she had heard was through other people. She had heard of them. That she would heard their story. She'd heard them. And actually, do you know what? I encourage you to speak. I encourage you to be bold. I encourage you to say, speak the gospel to your friends, families and co-workers and people around you. But you know what? If we act in faith, actually, people will hear about how you act, how you respond. People see when you go through, especially when you go through trials, when you go through sickness, when you go through illness, when you go through poverty, whatever, people from the outside will see. And they will see whether you say it or not, they will see how that you respond differently because the work of faith of God inside you than someone who doesn't. And that doesn't mean that we're all together, but it means that we that we acknowledge that we're not all together and that we need to lean on God. And like Rahab say, I'm God all together. I need you, God. 
and, and maybe 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 just a, your whatever happens in this pandemic it can be it, it can be a great witness honestly the way that we respond you know, whether you are whether you can't wait maybe your your schools have opened and you're 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 so happy that your kids can go back or maybe you're worried about that or or whatever you you, you don't trust what the government's going to do or maybe you fully trust i i don't know but what we we do know we do know okay is that it god loves us and as God has given us gifts of faith, and he has given us sufficient grace to be able to lean on him during this time of the coming months as we, we hopefully come out of this. And if people come, maybe you're there right now and you're thinking, do you know what? But why? Why would God do this in our time? Why would God, if God's all powerful, if God's almighty, why would he allow this pandemic? Why would he allow this, this pandemic to, to, to come across the earth. Why would he do this to us? Well, Jesus answers a very similar question in John 9. The disciples say, they see this blind man. And they, they say, as they went along the road, they saw a blind man. His disciples asked, Rabbi, who sinned that this man, or th this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Had this man done something wrong? Now, has, has he done something wrong? That means that you've judged him, made him blind. Or was his parents, he, were, he had really bad parents, so they cut, they, they, he, they, they, God, you, 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 you wanted to punish his parents by making, giving them a blind son? And Jesus says, neither. Neither. This man nor his parents sinned. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed. You know, and some people may be asking that, you know, has someone done something wrong? Have people done something wrong? Have people sinned? Have people upset God? Have people angered God? And, and that's why he's he's brought this pandemic. You know, his, his you know, it, was it was it me? Was, was it you? What was it? Was it our nation? Was it the, the traveller Steve, the businessman? Was it was it was it Bill Gates? Was it Huawei? Was it America? Was it China? Was it American labs in China? Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But maybe, and more likely, Jesus would say, this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed. That doesn't mean that the death and the heartache aren't tragic. That people affected by this isn't heartbreaking. And it is. And trust me, Jesus grieves for every hurt and dying so, more than any of us could possibly imagine or ever could. But maybe this season, this time that we're living through, is here so that God may display his glory like we've never seen before. See, Ephesians 2 says that faith is a gift. So, so my encouragement to you guys is let's stop. Let's take time. Maybe if we, what if we stopped every day for a moment and prayed, God, give me faith that you might move in these days. And then we prayed in faith that God would move in individuals that we know. We pray again for people that we'd lost kind of hope for. You know, see, see, the story of Rahab shows us that God can use anyone in his plan. Now she, she was she was different in the spot from the spies in every single way. They could not have been more different, opposite ends of the spectrum, you know. But God stepped in and saved her. You see, God stepped in and saved her. He didn't just step in and save her. Actually, he made her part of his plan. She makes the Bible several times. Well, it's more than I did. She makes the Bible, more than any of us did. She makes the Bible several times. It says here that, <clears throat> that, that um, in, 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 in the book of Matthew, in the very beginning, it gives the genealogy of Jesus. And it says that Rahab is in that family line. You see, it says that, 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 that Salmon was the father of Boaz who was the mother of Ruth. See, Rahab was Boaz's mum, who, who was Obed's grandmother, 
who was Jesse's great grandmother, who was King David's great great grandmother. She is in the family line of Jesus. She, she, God didn't just accept her. Didn't just accept her. He brought her in. See, God saves. God can save anyone, not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of what He has done. God saves everyone. God saves anyone. God can save anyone, not because of what what, what we've done, but because of who He is. God changes hearts. God changes mind. God saves. So who would you like? Who do you want God to save? Who do you want God to move on? See, see, I, I, I can hundred percent guarantee that they are a hundred percent more. If you were to rate people from least likely to most likely to to be a Christian, Rahab is a hundred percent less likely than whoever you have in your mind. You see, see, see. And Rahab itself, her name means proud. I mean, she was. She, it it kind of just enforces the fact that she was. It wasn't just her people. Who were against God. She was against God. Jericho, the city means moon city. It means that they worship the moon. And they didn't worship God. She, she, she was a Canaanite. These, these people sacrificed their own children to false gods. And God said that he was going to judge the Canaanites when their sin, when the things they would, had done was at their very worst. That's now. That's now for them. That's that's in the book of um, that's in the book of Joshua. So she is one of the worst people live, and you know, and in her people, she is seen as one of the worst people. She's a prostitute. She she, she is seen, and so she she is seen as one of the worst people living in the worst city in the worst place on earth at that time. And God saves her. See, no one is too far from God. No one is too far from his saving gift of grace. Guys, I want you to be I want to be encouraged, Christian, that there is no one too far gone. No one, anyone God can save. And so let's pray with faith. Let's start praying again in faith that God would move, that God would save, that God would change hearts like he and only he could do. And finally, I just want to end on this. Maybe you're you're listening to this, you're watching this, and you feel like that you are a Rahab, that you have done stuff, you have said stuff, you've thought stuff, you have lived your life in such a way that means that you're too far from God. That God could never love or forgive you. Let me say to you with confidence. God forgave Rahab. And that, and that on a human level might seem completely unreasonable. Why would he, how could he forgive someone like Rahab? She was the worst of the worst. But he didn't just forgive her, he had a plan for her. See, we worship a God who loves what this world would say was unlovely. Who forgives what this world would say is unforgivable. A God who shows grace and mercy to anyone who calls on his name. That includes me and that includes you. So I don't care what you've done, how bad you think you are. God loves you and God is willing to accept you. And, and, and so are we as a church. We... we God loves broken people. And that's what the church is here for. Because it's not about you. And what you are like. It's about God and what he's done. It's not about what you've done or said or thought. Or what you're going to do and say. It's about what our God is like. Let's pray. Lord Jesus. God, I pray right now that you would, for every single person listening to this, you would raise faith. You would raise up faith inside us. God, just like for Joshua and the army and the people, they have an impossible task before them humanly to go and take the land. God, and so do we. God, to, to change lives, to see people one for you. To see the lost saved. To see broken hearts mended. 
to see the unforgivable forgiven, the unlovely loved. God, but the, the wonderful, wonderful truth is that we don't do it on our own. It is you who does it. It is you who change minds. It's you who changes lives. It is you who saves. Not because of who we are or what we've done, but because of who you are and what you have done. God, raise up faith inside us right now. God, give us faith again. Stir faith inside us right now for those who we've lost faith for, for those who we once witnessed to, for those who we once prayed for, and now we no longer because we feel like it's too big. It's, too, it's God's fault. They're too far from you. Lord God, give us faith again that you can save anyone and maybe you might just save them. Lord God, you can use anyone and maybe you just might use our words. You might just use our actions. Lord God, and if there's anyone, anyone, anyone listening, watching this right now. God, I pray that you'd stir that gift of faith in us, in them, and let them know that you love them, you accept them, and you will forgive them and call them your child if they call on your name. Amen.